Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to our discussion entitled, What Does a Post-Vaccine America Look Like? I'm Matthew Quint, Director of the Center on Global Brand Leadership at Columbia Business School, putting on this webinar today. And I'll be moderating the session with our guest and friend of the center, John Gerzema, CEO of the Harris Poll. This is an incredibly broad topic. Uh, and as we've been reminded again in the past week, uh, one that continues to change constantly. Uh, so today's session will be focused specifically around public polling and data that the Harris Poll has been conducting since March, both its weekly COVID-19 tracker, which is very interesting and provides trend data over the course of the pandemic, as well as issue-specific polling that the firms conducted on specific issues over the course of the last year. You know, we remain in turbulent times and I look forward to John's data and our discussion with him and you about you know, the public's fears, their life choices, their financial expectations and their trust in institutions. And what will that mean for the relationships between people and people and institutions and people and businesses and ideas, the core of what it takes to build a strong brand. So without further ado, uh, Evangeline, why don't you take down the holding slide and uh, let's bring John up with me to our virtual stage. Hey, Matthew, how are you? Good morning. Hey, John, good morning, or I guess we're afternoon here on the East Coast. Who knows where people are watching this from? Uh, it's great to host you again. Uh, it's been a while since we've had you on our Bright Conference stage uh, twice uh, with both sharing talks about your books uh, that you wrote over the course of the past decade, The Brand Bubble, um, about the impacts on, on consumers in the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, and of course, The Athene Doctrine, which looked at uh, women in leadership, and I'm sure you <laughs> have reflections on both of those in today's yeah. crisis times right now. Absolutely, without a doubt. And I'm really excited to be here. I think uh, what I'd love to do maybe is just share a little bit of data and uh, hopefully we can then get in and have a discussion uh, with the community. That's great. Yes, I know you have a, a fascinating deck on this. Uh, folks may well want to plan uh, to keep the webinar on full screen <laughs> because there's a lot of detail, uh, data detail in the decks. Uh, and you know, as John's getting ready to share his deck, uh, so you can go ahead, John. Um, let me remind you of uh, a few logistics. So uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with Zoom. If you can, uh, please try to use the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom to ask questions as they occur to you over the entire course of the webinar. That's the best way for us to be able to see them. Uh, I mean, we will be monitoring a bit of the chat as well, but uh, that will be a little easier for us. And also we are recording the webinar. Uh, so we we'll are be excited to share it with you as well as uh, John's decks, his slide uh, after the event, as soon as they're available. And uh, now let me let John take things away. Thanks, Matthew. Um, well, you know, I think the way to maybe start this is to talk about the four eyes, right? We have the impeachment, uh, the second impeachment within 400 days, but the impeachment also connects to the infection, which is the second eye. You know, in between impeachments, we've had staggeringly, you know, the highest single uh, daily rate of COVID-19 uh, um, deaths in our country, or cases rather, at 4,300. Um, deaths rather, and the overall death tolls eclipsed 380,000. I was reading this morning that they contrasted that, Matthew, to um, nearly the number of Americans who were killed in World War II. So with all that sort of dislocation, there has been another intertwining uh, theme that we're gonna touch on, the third eye, which is uh, injustice. Injustices of all kinds, uh, economic, uh, racial inequality. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about obviously the insurrection and how those sort of all theme together. What they do is they sort of tangle together into this American narrative that we call um, the curtain of fear. 
And uh, as you mentioned, Matthew, we've been in field uh, tracking COVID-19 on a weekly basis since mid-March. At the beginning of the crisis on the left-hand side, you can see there was a lot of disbelief. 54% of Americans thought the national fear was irrational. Today, almost a quarter believe that that national fear um, is sensible. Clearly, COVID has been highly politicized, which creates some variance uh, in those numbers. But what I find really interesting as a researcher is how fear shot up, how it sort of came in different waves, beginning with sort of fear of ventilator shortages, then moving into fear of economics, uh, then into fear of, of leaving home for essential errands. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can still see, um, even as of this past weekend, um, fear very much in the high 70s uh, across most of these different metrics. But let me just point your attention to the green and the orange lines at the bottom. Uh, the green line is fear of dying, uh, which as of this past weekend in America became uh, ticked up three points to 57%. So the majority of Americans are very much afraid of COVID's mortality on them and their families. And at the same time, they're almost equally concerned about fear of losing their job. So the economic intertwining with the existential fears of, of dying has become sort of a, a really scary chart that I think really reflects um, how Americans are feeling. And obviously it's been amplified by these other eyes that we just discussed. Um, one of the things we did at the beginning uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic was to start to understand when people thought life would come back to normal. And this chart looks at um, green uh, by activity, which means I will do this activity, I believe in 30 days, orange is within three months, beige is six months, and then blue is a year or longer. And the main thing that's happened over time is that a lot of what we thought was gonna be green, those numbers have declined and the beige and the blue have increased as um, sort of the pandemic wore on. But uh, as of this past weekend, about 39% of Americans believe they'll be back to the office within 30 days. That then cumes up to 54% within three months, 67%, that's really where we hit sort of critical mass in six months. And then the last tail is about um, 13 a year or longer. And you can kind of see as we move across that chart that you can see that the things that, that sort of correlate most with closeness, you know, uh, going to the office, going out to dinner, those things seem to be more within reach. But then you move your way further along to going to the gym, flying on a plane, you can see the distress in those industries related to the fact that those, those things are still sort of foreign. Now, in public opinion, this will continuously change as the vaccination rates uh, rise, we'll start to see some more changes, but you still have Americans very wary of attending social gatherings, uh, going to a sporting event, uh, or at the far end of the spectrum, taking a cruise. Um, very much Americans are dividing going back yeah. to the office. And I know, Matthew, some of the questions that were asked in the, in the previous um, sort of uh, advanced chats, we're asking about what, what is sticking and what isn't. And what's happening here that's kind of interesting in a survey that we did recently with Morning Brew, we found that actually Americans have found, 55% have found that during COVID, I actually did not miss the office as much as I thought. Um, but there's 45% that have kind of become fatigued with it and bored. Um, what has really happened in the optimal sort of uh, way that Americans would like to work moving forward is three days home and two days in the office is where we hit sort of a majority. They intersect a little bit between three and two and two and three, but that's sort of the sweet spot. Yeah. Um, just for a moment, uh, back to slide four, because I saw there were a couple of specific questions that I think are, were relevant. One was, uh, what week essentially was this taken? And I believe this was just this is the data from last week. Is that right? Yeah, this is this is this past weekend. Great. And, and then, the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can we trend this over time. And so basically what, what has happened is we're just sort of constantly looking at at Americans um, level of confidence by activity. And then the other question was, obviously, you look at these and you're like, go to offices like these don't add up to 100 percent. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you can dial into where the bars are representative and where there must be some kind of a multiple choice uh, factor going on in, in the chart. Yeah, it is basically modeling the data to cum how people um, believe they're going to act. So 39% of Americans say that they would go back to the office now within 30 days. And then that's an additional, when we get to six months, we're adding in the next uh, number of people. So that gets us to 54, then we get to 67, then to 30, 13. 
Got it. So, so it's right that up until up until it keeps, exactly. keeps driving up. Great. Correct. So we're adding, adding the numbers as we move along. Excellent. Yeah. And so the other thing that's sort of uh, interesting is the whiplash effect. And we've seen this sort of start to um, decline a little bit. But early on, there was massive urban panic. Right. And um, we asked this question on the right hand side, how much more uh, or likely are you to buy a home in the next six months? Um, and among the general public, public about 24%, those folks in the urban uh, centers clearly were interested in homes outside of cities at 30, 38%. And as you moved your way further out of the quote unquote blast zone, you had people that were pretty content being just where they were, where there was more about space as a premium. And on the left-hand side, you can see this sort of same dynamic happening, which is like, where do you want to live? and rural are just fine. People out in the country are very happy at 84%, but you started to see uh, as the terms of the various choices among the orange people in the city, 42% were sticking with the city. But then when we looked at other choices that people could take, again, on a multiple choice basis, there was actually 30% that were contemplating being 10 miles out, 25% and being 20 miles out, and then 29% were gonna go full green acres for anybody who's old enough to know that um, <laughs> that sort of analogy. I mean, um, I think it's really interesting actually that, again, the way you subdivided rural, right, to be out 21 miles, it'd be interesting to see where that, what that mileage point would be, right? Um, between totally. suburban and rural in that. I mean, I just, those struck me, the suburban and urban, folks interested in even, you know, up to almost, you know, a quarter to a third sort of feeling even further out is getting to be more of a comfort zone. Yeah. Absolutely. And in some work we did recently with uh, OAAA, you know, we looked at some really interesting dynamics around that, Matthew, the idea that um, we call it the trend out is in, right? Is it not only is are you further out of the city, but there was just massive interest in the outdoors and how that's driving um, interest in, in uh, awareness of outdoor advertising, but also the fact that um, lots of other dimensions around going out are working in terms of um, exercising outside, obviously leisure outside, really interesting uh, things in our data. I can't get in all of it today, but like things like non-seasonal things like backyard barbecues and equipment and all were being bought for a suburban backyard. So out is definitely in. Um, there's a lot to talk about here. I'm, I'm going to hit it at a high level, but this is a critical area of sort of all of our data is around what's happening with the economics impact. So as, as bad as, as it is in terms of, of the virus and the health, public health crisis, the economic impact, in fact, is actually what is more concerning to Americans uh, over the long term versus the virus itself, as we can see on the left. And then, you know, we asked this question, you know, what what has gone on in your household as a result of the pandemic? And we can clearly see um, the dislocation and the financial distress, uh, particularly on, on BIPOC, on, on people of color. And so that is sort of manifest itself. We're also seeing very strong numbers um, against youth. Um, you know, 41% of Gen Z and millennial have cut back on savings versus 29% of boomers. And we sort of see similar statistics. So really overall, 82% of people have been impacted financially, but there's acute pain being felt with people of color and with younger Americans. Um, it's important to note that with that fear, there's also desire. And we've kind of talked about this throughout the, the entire pandemic, is this tension, this collision between fear and desire. And, and that is because we miss a lot, right? We miss, we're social creatures. So Americans three quarters miss gathering with friends and family, dining out, shopping, having celebrations, social gatherings, doing things that are just part of life, going to a movie theater, you know, going to church. These are all above the majority of Americans that really miss this. And importantly, as we always look at these are the demographic splits and where things that we long for and how that impacts in terms of our own cultural experience. So for example, going to church, you know, nearly two thirds of black Americans really miss that. Uh, attending concerts, theater, and sporting events tends to skew a, a little more among Hispanic Americans. So that's sort of what's happening in, in society. And so obviously the elephant in the room is, is vaccine and the distribution. And let's focus on that for just a minute or two. Um, clearly there's frustration. Um, you know, 47% of Americans think it's going too slowly. In a poll we just released with Axios this week, 
Um, and by and large, they are um, sort of placing the blame in, in the current administration at 44%. Um, this I, to us is really interesting because we have been trending since um, April, this question about how likely are you to get uh, the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it becomes available to you. And you can kind of see uh, wave eight in, on April 20th at the bottom, there was a lot of optimism. 73% of Americans said that they would take um, gladly take the vaccine. You can see as we moved our way into the political season that, that numbers of likelihood dropped as the vaccine became politicized uh, during the fall election season. But it is taking back up. We now, as of this past weekend, 68% of Americans say they're likely to take it, 32% are not. And then within that 32%, um, it's just interesting to note sort of where the, the dimensions change. So some interesting dimensional changes among Hispanics, that number starting to go down uh, among not likely from 48 uh, to 38%. Um, the only place that we really see a, a holding off and actually even a growing distrust of the vaccine is among black Americans. I mean, African Americans have been for very many reasons, uh, historically very wary of public health uh, and the, the dangers that, that it presents to them. So within that context, you know, that's an, a critical issue. And in some advisory that we have been doing with uh, the CDC for their guidance, we're trying to pull apart these numbers and really understand the specific experiences by culture in order to provide the right influencers and the right messages uh, to be able to convince uh, folks that, that the vaccine is safe. Let's um, take a moment, uh, John. I think this one's a good <laughs> sure. pause for a second because I think this is great. I was going to you led me in. I came back on in part to make sure that there was uh, a sense of that. You know, where what's the advice? Is there anything you're seeing uh, just with the clients you work with now? It sounds like discussions with the CDC, et cetera, on on what's helping move the needle. Uh, from some of the politicization back towards numbers that are closer to uh, that initial instinct people had, which is, my gosh, there's a new, there's a new virus, yeah. a new vaccine will can cut this in the bud. And, and again, once then politicization, then you get the, the, the lack of it being super timely and it, that nervousness about will sure. it come out, when will, you know, and all of it goes down and we're seeing it come back up. Any inclination on, on what's helping these yeah. numbers? get back up and what might be advice uh, for those working in the space on this uh, to continue to, to try to drive this. Definitely. And so, I mean, maybe this is the fifth eye, which is information. <laughs> so we went deeper into um, into their fears to try to, you know, dissect and understand them. And, and this gives you sort of a top line look at what the concerns are in America um, by, a, by a few demos. And so, you know, the major fear among the general public um, is the side effects. Right, they're unknown, and there's been lots of concern there. The second one is uh, at 43% is that we've rushed this too quickly. Right, is this truly a safe vaccine? And this intersects with a lot of institutional mistrust. I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, they're worried that it's not going to be efficacious. It's not going to prevent them. About a third of Americans, um, and then you know they don't know what's inside of it. And you know as you look at some of these numbers, you can see among on the orange among African Americans again this legacy of mistrust, again rightfully placed uh, on the government, uh, which is I don't know what's in it. Um, how that number pops at 37 percent, and I don't trust the government to make it safe at 36 percent. So I guess to kind of answer your question. This is not about anti-vaxxers. This is, you know, I think we've sort of, to some extent, um, you know, criticized or demonized um, this small group that aren't gonna take it, when in fact they have very rational, practical sort of concerns that need to be addressed by health professionals and, and by our leadership uh, through information. We asked this question, you know, about the fact that this is a constantly sort of a dynamic and moving issue. So two thirds of the American public say seeing people that I know uh, get the vaccine first is gonna go a large way toward me feeling comfortable. So as we move through the, um, you know, the administration of the vaccine as more groups move into uh, getting it, that should continue to make people feel comfortable. I think that's a really important stat at the top. Um, I, I see that as, John, it's like the herd immunity effect of vaccines and or obviously 
you know, getting being subjected to COVID-19, it's almost there's an information herd effect. That's exactly right. Right. Is is well, that right. the seeing your name in the same way that that confidence effect is occurring as you see what we expect from the from the testing and the trials, which is really actually not many side effects um, from the vaccine. And as people begin to see those they trust, hopefully exactly we'll get that information herd confidence. It, absolutely. And that, you know, again, points to sort of targeting by various demographics. There's a lot of custom messaging, but a lot of this revolves around people in your family, your close circle of friends, taking the vaccine and feeling safe is going to really uh, create that information herd. You're absolutely right. Um, another headwind, though, is this this thing about hearing about a new strain of COVID-19. So again, another valid question, right? Americans, half Americans are saying, well, what if I take this shot and it doesn't really prevent me from this new strain? So again, I just think it's really important not to sort of demonize that, that one third that are sort of sitting on the fence. They do have sort of rational questions that need to be addressed. And sort of similarly, you know, hearing about others who are skeptical um, that now feel safe about it. Uh, is another area to sort of explore. Um, now, what's really working against us in terms of the headwinds is, you know, this American uh, distrust, mistrust, you know, the ideology that we have and how we consume our media is really shaping sort of this outlook. And we can see, we asked this question, how much do you support um, or how much do you trust or distrust each of the following institutions? And just look at these numbers, you know, three quarters of uh, two thirds of Americans and three quarters of Republicans don't trust social media, right? We have a high degree of mistrust for, for Congress, for the president, for even the national media. The majority of Americans, 52% do not uh, trust national media. Almost 50% do not trust the justice system. Um, voting by mail, American democracy, 40%. Electoral college, we basically just looked at all these different institutions and these are the sorts of things that Americans really are, are sort of feeling a, a lot of mistrust. And then we asked a question uh, this past weekend, you know, who do you place the blame uh, for the, the rioting at the Capitol? And clearly 85% have been placed, uh, Americans have been placed right squarely on the rioters, but you have 75% of the American public that are, that are putting, placing blame with uh, the president. And we also have almost a near amount of of people placing blame with social media companies and two thirds with mainstream media. So as you move your way along, you kind of see this sort of toxic cocktail of mistrust and how institutional mistrust is intersected uh, with messaging and with media mistrust. And that's only gonna grow. Um, I'll just focus on two things here and briefly, but notice that um, there's a question that says, um, at the top, I will speak out against misinformation on social media when I see it. This was an answer to a question of what good, if any, do you think will come from the events uh, at the Capitol? So some people say that they're going to speak out against misinformation. That's almost a third at 27 percent. But look down a little bit later. I will try to broaden my sources of media only 15 percent. So literally people say they're gonna speak out, but they're not gonna to listen to other people and they're not gonna look at other forms of media. So these echo chambers are probably only gonna to continue to grow. And that really sort of, I think, manifests itself in this question that we asked about the incoming Biden administration. 39% of Americans um, are optimistic among the general public. Clearly Dems are delighted at 62%, Republicans not so much at 16%. But then you can see other questions, you know, high degree of concern among Republicans. This is sort of the, the again, the turbulence that the president will, new president elect will be facing. However, there's some good things that I think that are coming out of this. Uh, we just did a poll this week with USA Today. Um, we asked the question, you know, what did you think? What was your view on permanently suspending President Trump's Twitter account? And clearly 61% support it, 47% uh, of whom strongly support it, um, particularly women uh, at 66%. And, you know, even there was a fair degree of, of GOP uh, support at 36%. Um, and as we look forward, we see that in terms of the Biden administration, there's a lot of confidence around handling COVID. Almost two thirds of Americans believe that, that they're optimistic that, that the president elect will do a good job. 
The economy uh, becomes less, uh, less certain, but still strong numbers at 59%. But then when you get to racial equality, that's at about 58%. And, you know, I think what's also really interesting um, in that support is that, and I believe the president is having, uh, making an, some announcements this evening um, here on, on Thursday, but what we see is the majority of Americans actually really say that Biden should crack the whip and, and create some mandates. So 75% agree wearing a mask in public is a, is a mandate that Biden administration should fo focus on. S receiving a test, limiting gatherings of more than 10 people, 66%, even temporarily closing non-essential businesses uh, at 58%, and 56% believe that all Americans should receive a COVID vaccine. Interestingly enough, last week, Matthew, 44% of Americans said that the government should pay Americans uh, to take the vaccine. So the point here, I think, I, is yep. that- I, I just, I remember seeing, seeing that data point. Um, and when you finish up, also, I have a quick thing yeah, on the slide before too. Yeah, go for it. Um, on the slide, I, so if you want to go to the slide before, I found it interesting, um, right, if you look at some of the splits along, you know, party affiliation here, uh, it's nice. This I find a little encouraging, hopefully a little different from the slide before in which I think the GOP numbers were lower. And when you get to specificity, right, there's a sense of like the administration, when you think about it at the largest standpoint, people, because there are so many topics they're thinking of, if they have any issue that they're worried about, that they don't think is going to be well done by the incoming administration, they're worried. But it's nice to see the specificity down to pandemic treatment and economy that we're getting back to, you know, a third or more pretty much of even GOP leaning individuals showing some confidence uh, that things will get better. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and we do a, a sister poll with Harvard, the Harvard-Harris poll, and um, I'll find a link and send to the community afterwards. I don't have enough time to get into all of it here, but we did a, a deep dive on the election. Um, we were proud to say we were only four points off. I think we were the tightest poll in, in the analysis on the, on the president. But what was really interesting was that um, the majority of Americans that uh, voted uh, for Biden uh, were moderates. And so it was really interesting to kind of see there is a very silent middle um, that, you know, hopefully could sort of be driving a little bit more of the consensus building and some of these things that we've just talked about. Um, the really good thing here is that I think th there's a lot of confidence that, that um, President uh, Joe Biden will have a better, more organized plan for rapid distribution of the vaccine at uh, 64%. Um, bringing science back, you know, at 59% to guide public policy. Um, and then a lot of the issues that really took a back seat over the past year, you know, we had climate change sort of in the low teens in terms of an important priority last year. That's back, you know, at uh, 58%. And then public support for increased restrictions we talked about and some of the other uh, issues that are on the minds of Americans, they believe uh, he'll do a good job on. Um, they're also hopeful that he will um, help heal the very deep, raw wound cultural divides, as we talked about earlier, the injustices. And here we get a 59% uh, hopeful um, top box, uh, very hopeful 25%, and somewhat hopeful at 34%. You know, this is a um, obviously a massive stain and wound uh, on the American psyche. There's been a lot of reckoning uh, over the past year, but clearly, as we saw, you know, with um, the events in the Capitol, uh, there's just been a lot of, of work that still clearly needs to be done. Um, and I'm gonna get in and talk about that just for a couple of seconds. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, to look at this data through the lens of experience. And one of the things that we saw this past weekend is that, you know, black Americans by and large, when describing the events that happened at the US Capitol uh, this past Wednesday, they were the most likely among all Americans to describe it um, for what it was as a riot. Um, you know, 50% of whom described it as a terrorist attack on the country. Um, you know, and then 61% overall of Americans say it's a riot, a terrorist attack. Um, not as many uh, folks, by and large, about a third of Americans described it as an insurrection, half that a coup d'etat, 17% a revolution. Um, you know, we just wanted to understand how Americans were framing this. 
And then we asked which of the following best describe people involved in what happened there. And again, the preponderance of people describe them as, as rioters and less so uh, terrorists and, and then radicals. But I wanna to touch a little bit more on um, this racial sort of look at a lot of the events that, that are taking place. And we go back and we look at, at some of our data and it's really complex to try to unpack and, and understand, Matthew. I mean, on one hand, in our data, most recent data, white Americans are both for Black Lives Matter and not defunding the police, right? So they see those things in both ways. And we've asked this question this past weekend, how would you rate the police in your community on the following? The general public numbers are in green and they're by and large in the 70s on being helpful, um, you know, not using excessive force. But then you really start to see the difference between white America and black America, between the orange and the blue respectively on these questions. You know, most notably not using ex ex um, excessive force, 79% of Americans versus 41% of black Americans. So this is really the chasm uh, that exists in our country, the actual experiences that form these views in public opinion and what make us sort of look at, at, at situations and institutions uh, so differently. So one of the things that we have at the Harris Poll is we're able to go back and um, look at historical data. And when uh, we went through the tragic killings of, of George Floyd uh, this summer, I ran back and looked at a 2014 Harris Poll that was conducted right after the, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And just look at the differences in 2014. Um, green are black Americans, orange are white Americans. And we asked, you know, we asked this question, do you think uh, black Americans are discriminated against in which area or not, right? The way they're treated by police, the delta between, between believing that between black Americans and white Americans was 30 points nearly the same in terms of getting full equality. And then look at the massive gaps on all the other elements of systemic racism, right? Wages, getting white collar jobs, decent housing, you know, getting skilled labor jobs. You can just see the, the difference in the understanding of black America versus, versus white America. And then what we see is just a closing of that gap. I'll do this like we do the optometrist. Does it look better here or here? right? Same exact questions. And we can basically see as those orange lines start to move to the right, this sort of reckoning and starting of understanding of awareness. Notice too, between 2014 uh, and today and six years later, those numbers haven't moved with black America. Like they've been there all along and it's the white uh, Americans that are starting to, to get a little more woke to what's happening. John? Yes. Uh, on that, just curious, was this, this seems to be a, a more of a one-off poll that you ran with these questions at, I'm guessing at some point in, in June or? Yeah, we, we ran these in June, um, right after the killing of, of George Floyd. This seems like one ripe for sort of follow-up given exactly what you pointed out, which is the, uh, there was a, that, the, the Black Lives Matter, the event that happened into the defund the police um, theme that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement right after that. Uh, it will be interesting to see even in 2020 where these numbers have moved. Um, I definitely have seen some other polling data uh, from firms that tracked it over the course of a you know month afterwards kind of thing. And you saw some of these numbers decrease, unfortunately, um, because of the still yeah. disconnect on what the solutions are. Uh, it's a great point. Ba battling these problems. So we look forward to maybe <laughs> sharing a bit from you guys later on where you, you know, your 2014, 2020 and 2021 uh, data on these points. Great. Yeah, we'll definitely put that back in. I think it's a great idea. Um, just a couple other things. We're going to now just segue um, to a couple other data points about a look ahead. Um, number one, we, we do a lot of work with the American Psychological Association. And this is a sort of a result of, of various polls uh, that we've been conducting with them over the past year. And, you know, clearly there's a mental health crisis uh, in America. Most notably, it's really interesting, um, you know, sad, but younger people are reporting a high degree of increase in stress. But what's also really fascinating is they're about 15 points higher on believing that mental health and wellness should be destigmatized and that we should be talking in a very open and honest way 
about um, our mental health. And so it's really fascinating to us, Matthew. Again, we have a white paper on this, I'm happy to send it around, but it looks at how courageous young people are and how they are taking away the stigmas about talking about therapy and about getting help and how that I think is really interesting and hopeful. Also, this is hopeful. Um, the three uh, things that we've been tracking along in terms of overall emotions um, that have stayed high throughout the pandemic has been appreciative, thankfulness, and compassion. Uh, being appreciative, being thankful, and, and compassionate. And in a lot of our ethnographies that we've been doing uh, in American households, we've talked to parents who've said, as bad as everything is, I've actually had a reappraisal about my life and about my time with my children. I may have my 20 something kids back under one roof. We spent all kinds of time sheltering in place. We are reassessing relationships, strengthening relationships in some instances. And so there sense, tends to be a sense of, of a little bit of American Thanksgiving that's happening, up coming, kind of coming out of this and how those numbers have stayed high um, versus some of the more negative emotions like cabin fever and feeling overwhelmed and claustrophobic. Um, John, we, yeah, uh, just back on that. I mean, I agree with you. It's nice to see there does seem to be reflection. Um, it's very interesting if you look at, you know, some of the polling, like that little bump. Um, interestingly, not back in November, potentially around the election and the way that may have changed people's impressions of things. We see a bump more about the certification week. Um, no. We're leading into the holidays. Maybe that's a holiday that's, bump. That's the right? Christmas yeah. Passover. That's uh, that. That's Lonzo the holiday bump, bump. Right there. But yeah, no, but, absolutely. You can see it rise again, sort of in September. Um, yep. We've got a whole bunch of interesting data here that that's on our website, just around but, parents and kids and education, and it's it's some fun stuff. They have unfortunately though slipped a bit. Um, you know, over time, I think there is a. In the early phase, there was a little more of that bonding, and now there's a little exhaustion taking place of how long we've been at this different world yeah, we're living in. Definitely. Yeah. Well, we'll look at that next. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but there are some value shifts. I won't get into all this, but there seems to be more empathy, more openness, and some other uh, strong behavioral changes, um, you know, supporting charities. Uh, trying to reconnect with family and friends. A lot of these are the behaviors that, that Americans say that they're demonstrating. Um, we also talk about sort of now as we look at 2021 to, to finalize the, the slides so we can get into some conversation quickly, um, is sort of you know where we kind of look at um, what's changing and a few broad trends. One is we do believe even with vaccines, we're gonna be throughout this year at least in a state of what I call sort of uh, CV PTSD, um, which means the no contact lifestyle. You know, we just did some recent uh, MasterCard Harris poll polling and found just how powerful um, things are on the non contact lifestyle. Obviously, you know, people have said 73% have said, you know, the way that I've changed my shopping um, is going to be something that that I'm going to continue to do because 64% said it showed me how easy it is. Uh, clearly, as we talked about, space is now a luxury good. We have 56% of Americans in a morning brew Harris poll uh, that said um, that they shake hands less often. Um, and then safety is a customer journey uh, at 43%. Um, you know, again, focusing on, on trying to make things safe and contactless payments is a core of this. I believe there might be a question, Matthew, that popped up. I guess if not, I'll blast through the last couple things here. Um, from a consumer standpoint, as we kind of conclude, you know, there's a lot of category um, behavior that sort of has shifted and, and transpired. A lot of this we believe will resettle uh, once we're back out to life, but we saw new clothes, you know, vacations, traveling, the types of things that people want to do. You can kind of see how they've kind of gone up and down, but the most important enemy of consumption is savings. Right? We're basically seeing a lot of people putting savings um, on the timetable. That's the number one thing that they're doing. About half of all Americans are setting aside money for um, the great return. It's important too to know that even though they miss shopping, Americans have gotten very digitally savvy. So the acceleration of digital that, that the pandemic brought has brought a, a sense of customers, uh, consumers rather, feeling like they can supplant that with digital. So 
they miss shopping at 47%, but 23% are using more customer service chatbots, for instance, or 27% using more video reviews. So we're basically taking the in-store experience and trying to do the best job that we can do in a digital realm. Um, we also are seeing what we call the, revise, uh, the rise of revenge spending, right? The number one thing Americans want to do when things get normal is get out and take vacations. We think this is going to be an experience year. This is going to be a year that's about reconnecting with family and friends. I think there's a big opportunity for the, the brand marketers that are out there to understand that this is going to be a time to be very emotional. Emotional brands, brands are going to connect with the joy and the reconnection and the happiness that people are gonna feel coming out of this, I think are gonna do really well. And you can see on the right, the types of things people wanna do. In essence, it's gonna be a big party. Um, the last couple of things we wanna talk about is that we also think 2021 is gonna be an uncalendared year. And we see in our data, a lot of Americans sort of shifting their timeframes of when they're gonna celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving. That might happen now in June and July. So if you're a wedding planner or you're a photographer, you might find unanticipated demand. Um, and that's because Americans became used to a really staggered schedule, right? We had the masters in the fall, we had horse racing, the triple crown in the fall. So people are gonna be opportunistic and it's gonna be based on when they feel safe, when they're vaccinated and when they're going to, to take on experiences. And we saw in our trend, this workcation, people are burned out working and they want to spend more time getting out there. And we saw 68% said they would consider a work vacation with their kids who were doing remote learning anyway to go somewhere else and do all that together. So just a lot of non-traditional behavior. And last, I think, but not least, is Americans definitely plan to take a post-COVID vacation and, and see their family. This seems to be the big focus of what everybody sort of plans to do. And they are, however, going to continue wearing masks. They do believe that it's gonna take a long time before people feel normal again. And so the types of activities when we ask them, what do you feel comfortable doing in blue, neutral in beige and orange and not comfortable, you can still see across a lot of those activities that we talked about earlier, there's a lot of sort of sitting on the sidelines. So flying on a plane, 55% remain uncomfortable. Again, this is polling, these numbers will change with the vaccine rates, but that's sort of where the world looks like uh, right now. And uh, why don't we get in and have a quick uh, discussion for the 15 minutes we have left. Yeah, great to talk, uh, good to be back. Yeah, just uh, side by side here. So um, I think one just general question that I'm sure you'll affirm is you're over in the polling that you do, you weight that to be a representative sample to America. So the Democratic and GOP numbers and independents are sort of relative to their overall balance in the US. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we follow very strict polling methods. So everything is weighted to the proportions of the population. Great. Um, and uh, I think one of the, you know, things that came out of me was, you know, in all of this, we see change and you're obviously in polling, it's very difficult to ask percentages or how much it gets very complex. You have to go down to issues. But of course, as we talk about changing shopping habits, is it, I'm gonna use digital more, is that 80% more? Is it 10% more? Yeah. Is there anything you've seen so far, John, uh, through either the data or the work with some of the clients that you guys do We've got a sense of like how strong some of these changes are and what your expectations are. Yeah, I mean, we always say in polling that this is how people's minds are until they aren't, right? People constantly change their minds and that's why we continuously pulse. We have a, a Harris Poll SaaS product that is sort of in the field continuously gathering information on brands and consumers. So it helps us understand that. I think the way I'd answer that question is what are the things you kind of saw in some of those charts that have really remained static, right? You know, a, an attitude uh, or a stated behavior. And again, this is sentiment. This is not behavioral data that I've shared, but the types of sentiments that we see really sticking because they've been so consistent it, are the things that you'd expect. Blended work from home, um, digital acceleration, absolutely. Um, it's not to say that there isn't gonna be a return to store shopping because we saw that in the data. I think it was 43% miss shopping in stores, but um, the types of behaviors that have become muscle memory, 
um, you know, the ways in which uh, people are, are shopping digital clearly has has sort of created and eaten, eaten a lot of market share in terms of the physical retail environment. Great. Um, interesting question uh, from Robin in this sort of high conflicting turbulent times we're in around the presidential transition, some of the impacts you see of confidence in the incoming administration. Anything you're aware of on that as compared to, you know, numbers from 2016 or, you know, 2018, those kind of things. Um, did you did you try to look at that in a historical context of like, you know what, the reality is it's turbulent, but people are always a little nervous if it's not their party uh, or significantly nervous if it's not their party taking taking the office? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It definitely, there's always um, cynicism among, you know, splits. Uh, and that was clearly, I could have put that chart up about Republicans being upset with Biden, and I could have had Democrats being upset uh, with Trump. And I'm sure the numbers were similar. In fact, I'll, I'll look that up when I get the call. <laughs> I think the um, important part here is just how unique this year has been. It's created such dislocation that you do tend to see in the data um, an underlying hopefulness, at least I have, about a sense of, of, of disbelief that is now leading to some sort of a sense of, be, of beginnings of unity. I temper that with the data I shared with you about just how completely uh, Americans continue to exist in these eco chambers. I mean, the, their mistrust of institutions and social media and national media is really concerning. Right, yeah, one of uh, Alex Sharp has sort of asks, maybe you can follow up on insights around, and of course there's lots of polling, all sorts of media discussion on it, the, the reasons are different depending on where you step into social media or what your perceptions is about a little bit more about that distrust. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, where's the needle? Um, what do you expect things like, you know, the decision to boot President Trump from Twitter, et cetera, may have moving forward? Yeah, I mean, clearly you saw in the, in the data sort of a majority of Americans supporting that and GOP kind of crossing over. My sense is there seems to have been, and I, I say this not knowing this, I'm not a futurist, but there seems to have been sort of peak, um, peak dislocation in terms of the disbelief that Americans have right now. And there seems to be a little bit of a, of a pausing here. So the fact that we see those numbers among Republicans is the first time in the past year that I've seen sort of any crossing over uh, of any sort of traditional partisan uh, divides. Great. Um, there's also a question about, I think, curiosity about the work you're doing uh, with the American Psychological Association on mental health. And uh, are there, do, do you poll or and, and or have any instincts on this sort of, has there been movement on a willingness uh, to seek professional help? essentially for these situations there's as as you see this growing acceptance to it being something to discuss is there the follow up comfort and commitment to getting professional help yeah matthew it's one of the more encouraging uh things that we've seen this year and for anyone who's interested um the the survey is on our website but it's also at the american psychological association it's called stress in america and we uh release this survey every year and the really fascinating thing is how millennials, but really Gen Z, those younger Americans sort of, uh, I think broadly 13 to 24 or 26 was in our sample this year. They are, a, as I said, a 15 point difference in openness in talking about mental health. So the rise of talk space and, and those types of, of things have become very much a part of the way we might talk about working out right? Uh, or good nutrition. And that is just so helpful. Uh, and you see the numbers drop down to, you know, really low levels among boomers uh, and seniors. And so that I take forward as a, as a really hopeful thing is that people are very open to that young people, and hopefully they'll lead the way in creating uh, further mental health. And we didn't get into this, we could have a whole nother webinar about stress in America, but this is related to <laughs> you know, all the stuff we've shared, but where they see the nation going, um, you know, by and large, they, they see their personal communities, the things they can control, their families as the most important, but the more you get macro, the more the anxiety rises. 
Yeah, I would expect that. And I wonder if some of those, you know, Gen Z numbers are related to growing up in an age in which there has not been uh, mostly a time of not crisis, right? I mean, so their their lives are wrapped around it and therefore their discussions among their peers and their sense of things, uh, I imagine has has shaped this expectation of it's okay, we're, we're stressed, we struggle, we need to be talking about these issues. We don't know a life where it seemed like you could hide them. Um, right. So that, I think that that's interesting. Um, anything, uh, still a little like, you know, going back to some of the vaccine issues, right. Post <laughs> as the sort of overall topic of the discussion was, what will things look like post vaccine? And we know that, you know, it's, it's effective. It's, it's usage. And obviously we hope effectiveness, um, given everything we've seen from the trials, uh, a webinar that we held, uh, with, with Rob, your managing director, uh, in partnership with, uh, mm -hmm with Pfizer and, and Johnson and Johnson uh, back in, in the fall talking about the upcoming approvals. Um, and it was about other things, but we tackled that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of confidence in the early trials, those kind of things. You know, where do you expect that unknown side effects, rush development, et cetera? Do you think that there'll be a serious diminishing of that quickly? Or do you think, especially as it takes the rollout and all the logistics of it, time, will those just linger in people's minds? I'd answer that knowing that clearly I'm not a public health expert, I'm a, a polling yeah. <laughs> guy, but um, I think the, the best thing was sort of in that question about Americans you know, being concerned or they would take the vaccine when they see other people taking it. So again, like we talked about, the more that, as you, I think you said, information herd immunity happens, the more that we can expect uh, those other concerns to sort of diminish. And that's, you know, I mean, it's really kind of a little bit like Gartner's hype cycle, right? You know, there are early adopters and then there are laggards and the early adopters have their own reasons. And that's what's happening here. We have front frontline workers, we have uh, senior citizens and, and it's gonna work its way through. So the more it becomes mainstream, hopefully the more people, uh, their fears will diminish. Great. Uh, one other thought I had towards the end is you're discussing this sense of emotion, right? What what will brands of all kinds and all sorts of industries as hopefully we do get back towards safer ability to interact and travel and spend and do these things. Um, we saw, you know, early in pandemic, there was a lot of initial comfort in the, sa in the combination of safety and emotions. And then at a certain point, the jokes started to develop and the YouTube videos that were clipping together the exact same phrasings of all the brands, right? So that they, it was like that turn of where, you know, there's like these moments of where you can do it. And then there's moments where it becomes everyone's doing it and that differential and the impact on me disappears. How would you advise um, contemplating that for brands moving forward, staying on the pulse of that and understanding where there's, you know, emotional, but non-emotional or how, how you would manage that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Some of the, the data that we're seeing with our client at MasterCard, you know, we look at the spending pulse da data to try to understand too, kind of what's happening where people are planning. And there's a lot of emphasis on uh, planning travel in the third quarter, third and fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, in the data that I shared with you, a lot of emphasis on trying to reconnect with friends and family. And we have a tons of data that show how much Americans missed graduations and weddings and, you know, and uh, sadly funerals, right? I mean, this was a, a year unlike any other. And so the, the reconnection around family, uh, whether it's for mourning or celebrating or both or all of the above, that is gonna be a dominant emotion um, as the, this, hopefully this fear, curtain of fear, as I described it, uh, lifts. And I, so I think for brands, to be the, the catalyst for those connections and emotions, I think is just gonna be a, a very strong point of brand differentiation. So understanding and empathizing um, with, with America is gonna be key. And the benefit of that is that we've all been through it. This is the first time we've ever done uh, research that's basically on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is um, really gonna be an amazing, um, amazing year ahead, I hope. Excellent. Well, any final 
hopeful where, you know, maybe a, so, we pointed out some as you were moving along, um, but any particularly poignant kind of silver linings, let's say, uh, that you're seeing out of the data and or your personal or, or professional experience at the Harris Poll that are, you know, giving you a, a sense of hope around where we're going to pull through in this post-vaccine America. Yeah, I mean, clearly there's a lot of concerns around in the near term around the political instability, the echo chambers, the uh, dramatic gulfs that we have, um, you know, in our country. And yet, at the same point, like we just discussed, there's a lot of more micro optimism uh, that's existing in, in families and in communities. And our hope is is that that's going to you know sort of paint the way for for a, a recovery. Um, there is a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. We anticipate that in the data, and that that could start to you know diminish what I, I know today was a very disappointing jobs report. I think there were jobless claims at, at about a million uh, as of the 14th of January. So you know the hope is is that that recovery will speed up and the, the back half of the year will look a lot better than than the first half. Great. Well, this has been fascinating, John. I see we've gotten some nice comments around that from the audience as well. So let's all give John his virtual round of applause. Um, and uh, thank you for being here, John. And as a, a reminder, we are recording this uh, and we will share both this, uh, hopefully the deck, uh, on its own, as well as course, point you to some of the resources that the Harris Poll has on its site and with some of the partnerships that it runs as, as you all have further interest in dialing into public perceptions right now. Great, thanks, Matthew. And if anybody has any questions that we didn't get to, feel free to, uh, to reach out. I'll give you my email. <laughs> Excellent, thanks so thanks much, John. Have a good day. Bye everyone, enjoy your day.